But unknown to Bektasevich, the police were onto him. And just a few days after he recorded this video, they made their move. Bektasevich and his accomplices were arrested at his aunt's house in a Sarajevo suburb. When the police raided the apartment at number 71, they found inside almost 20 kilograms of ready-made explosives, consisting of nitroglycerine, TNT, and ammonium nitrate. They also found a bag, and inside the bag was a suicide belt, already made up with three sticks of explosives. Bektasevich was one man within a larger network. And you know, you start looking at Bektasevich and suddenly you realize how big this network is. The sheer extent of the network became clear when police discovered Bektasevich was discussing terror attacks with someone who was living much closer to home. British police look at Bektasevich's phone records and they realize, hold on a second, he's getting phone calls from London, from the UK. This is not about email, this is not about websites. This guy's getting phone calls from somebody in the UK. So, who was this mystery caller? What were his connections with Bektasevich and what was he up to? At the time, nobody had a clue. Detectives traced the phone call to this house in Shepherd's Bush in West London. The police didn't know it, but they were on the brink of an unexpected breakthrough. The caller was a close associate of Abid Khan. The security services knew him only by his online nickname, Terrorist 007. 007 was a seminal figure in the online growth of Generation Jihad. He was someone who demonstrated to the world of Generation Jihad, this young group of people arising, that it was possible to use technology, use the internet, use these social networking forums to burst through the glass ceiling of it's just the internet, it's just the web, and then move into the world of real jihad, real terrorism. Terrorist 007 was 22 years old, but like Abid Khan, his fascination with violent extremism had begun much earlier. As a teenager, he developed a twin obsession with computers and Al-Qaeda's ideology. Central Europe, however, is, is really the heartland of jihadi activity outside of... Aaron Weisberg is a terrorism consultant and a tracker of online jihadis. Through sheer persistence and know-how, he would become the nemesis of terrorist 007. Well, initially, he was nothing more than a fanboy. He simply supported Al-Qaeda, he wanted to help, and he tried to volunteer himself. Uh, as circumstances arose, he found ways to actually be quite a significant help uh, to the media operations of Al-Qaeda. And what was he doing? How was he helping them? When people had videotapes, for example, Zarqawi killed the American Nick Berg. The video of the beheading was uh, very, a very large file. It was not the kind of thing you could share effectively through email. And uh, there were really very few public services available to handle files of that size. So Air Hobby 007's mission was to break into, to steal access, to hijack other people's computers on the internet, and then use those hijacked computers uh, in order to upload and, and share videos from Al Qaeda in Iraq. Terrorist 007 had become an online celebrity. He confirmed his reputation by building the official website of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And all done from a bedroom in West London. Yeah, but that's not it though. I mean, there is evidence on his computer, never mind Al-Qaeda in Iraq. He was doing web work for Al-Qaeda Central, Asahab Media Foundation, Osama bin Laden's mouthpiece. He reached that level. The hunt was on for terrorist 007. Every time he went online, his enemy in the ether, Aaron Weisberg, was watching him, waiting for him to trip up. And 007 wasn't happy about it. Well, your hobby 007 was famous for asking online. Uh, he said if I was killed, all he wanted was one of my fingers as a souvenir. 
you know, like to be cut off my hand so he could have it and keep it in the freezer or something. Um, it takes all kinds. Despite the threats, Aaron Weisberg tracked him down to West London. We did this by applying pressure to him. If what he wanted to do was publish things on the internet, uh, we would have what he published removed from the internet, not in order to silence him, but to make him more active. Um, the busier he was, the more active we made him, the more likely it was that he was going to make a mistake. Eventually, he did make that mistake. Aaron Weisberg lured him into an online trap. By analyzing what 007 put on the net, Weisberg traced his location and tipped off the police. The security services had other priorities at the time, and terrorist 007 slipped through the net. It wasn't until 18 months later, following the tip-off from Sarajevo, that the police swooped on this house in Shepherd's Bush. Officers who raided it had been briefed that they were looking for a man by the name of Yunus Tsuli. They had a name, but that was all. Yunus Tsuli, as it turned out, was the real name of terrorist 007. One of Al-Qaeda's most obsessive propagandists was now behind bars. It's a very dark world. It's like they suffer from a kind of uh, self-inflicted post-traumatic stress disorder. They expose themselves to violence and to visual portrayals of violence. The effect that it has is, is that they become increasingly desensitized uh, and increasingly inclined to try and perpetrate violence on their own. But just how did terrorist 007 fit in with the rest of this network? Files on his computer showed that he was working hand in hand with Abid Khan from Bradford. Khan is a very bright guy. I mean, you, to say that is an, an understatement. In the world of terrorist recruits, especially homegrown terrorist recruits, Khan is a, a, a leading light. The net was closing in on Abid Khan, but for the moment he was still at large, still running his social networking site, downloading and distributing vast quantities of Al-Qaeda propaganda. The scale of the material was 2.5 terabytes, which meant nothing to us at the time. But as people said, don't, don't hit the print button. Uh, it'll still be going now. And it's taken us two years to go through that material. But any young Muslim could access material on the internet. Well, that's actually not the case. The, the material that we uncovered is stuff that is, 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 is material that is put out by Al-Qaeda. It's, it, it's how to poison people. It's how to avoid surveillance by security services. This isn't stuff that is readily available, and that was part of the case that, that we had. It wasn't about curiosity. This was actually about training and, and how to carry it out in the country. And did he spend a lot of time on the computer, on the internet? Not really, no. I mean, he was out and about, but, right? you know, and, uh, I couldn't really, I don't know, I mean, you know, everybody spent, you know, uh, in that period, uh, there wasn't many computers about, you know, I mean... Uh, Did Abid have his own computer? No, not really, no, no. I, was there a computer at home? There was, right, but, I mean, uh, it was just like men used to play games, right, you know. Khan travelled backwards and forwards to Pakistan, forming links with violent jihadi groups and their training camps. On his last trip, he made a video of his travels. Khan claimed that he was in Pakistan to help the victims of an earthquake disaster. Police, however, suggested that there was a more sinister motive for his trip. Khan himself gives a clue in one of the few moments when he appears in front of the camera. What are you feeling about this place? Huh? That's good place. Nice place for bad people. <laughs> <laughs> nice place for bad people. <laughs> <laughs> bad people, why? Dear. Why did he make the video? Uh, it's sales pitch, isn't it, really? Um, you know, th this is what happens to you as you go through the radicalization process. And on his computer, there was a letter revealing more.